Hi and welcome to the Digital Studio Sessions at Jakarta Futures Forum 2025. I'm Lavanya and I'm a fellow at ORF. Today I have a wonderful panel with me. Um, I have uh, Scott Cunningham, who's the co-founder and chief executive officer at SD, SD Guild, United States of America, and Gregoire Roos, who's the director of uh, political dialogue and policy innovation at BMW Foundation, Herbert Kwan, France. Today we have a very interesting discussion, which is on the great AI war games. Um, so I want to kickstart the question by um, setting the, um, um, the theme, which is the running theme, which is tech nationalism. We have the chat GPT versus the deep seek um, world. We have everyone, um, um, you know, aspiring for digital sovereignty, um, uh, digital autonomy. So in this um, setup, um, and I want to start with you, Scott, how do you think Silicon Valley is responding to this, US tech companies, how are VCs responding to this? Especially we've also seen recent Trump's pressure on um, Apple to move back production uh, you know, back home. So how is this all playing out in the Silicon Valley? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this whole tech na nationalism sort of movement is definitely reshaping uh, markets and investments and and global alliances. Um, you know, a decade ago, a a startup founder in Silicon Valley could dream up a product, host it on AWS, manufacture it in Shenzhen, and then sell it worldwide. And at the time, they really didn't even need to think too much about politics. But today, that world is gone. Right. Um, tech nationalism has really redrawn the map. So I would say there's really three things that we need to think about as truly global citizens around this, this issue in this time. First, you know, these alliances are no longer just about military, right, or trade. Um, they're now really about technology and a tech stack. So countries are racing to secure their own chips, right? They're racing to build and deploy their own clouds and their own AI models. You mentioned DeepSeek versus GPT versus, you know, Anthropic or Claude, right? There's so many now. And China's progress arguably in open weight AI models and semiconductors is real and accelerating at a much faster rate than those in the US. If you're not in control of your digital destiny, then then you're really, really vulnerable. Second, you sort of mentioned, you know, the market is fragmenting. This old model of, you know, building one global product, one global company, one global standard, it's breaking down. And companies now, they really need to navigate a patchwork of regulations, uh, political red lines. It's, it's not just a headache for big companies, it's a, a huge opportunities for, for those who are able to localize rapidly and really build connections and bridges across divides. And then third, from an investment strategy standpoint, those strategies are shifting as well. The capital is flowing towards more, I guess what you'd classify as resilient plays uh, you know, dual sourcing, local partnerships, interoperability in some domains. My recommendation though is don't don't just play defense, right? Uh, you know, ask yourself and figure out how can my company, how can my country help write the new rules and not just follow them? Because if you're only reacting, then then you're already going to be behind. So um, before I move to Greg, I have a quick follow-up question on that. I think um, you brought out an interesting point, right? Like how private sector is um, uh, looking at uh, tech nationalism. Now, in a scenario where you brought up French shoring, um, so if Apple had to move out of China, they would be aligned. But if they had to move out of India and move it back to the US, they may not be as aligned. So there's a difference or there's an appetite uh, that they may have um, for tech nationalism. 
So um, clearly there will be a divergence between how policies are going to, or governments are going to view it like a Trump versus uh, an Apple. So then how does, uh, the, how do these dynamics play out then? Because should, because in Trump 1.0 versus, um, you know, uh, the admin, Biden administration after, there wasn't, many, uh, there wasn't much difference in the policies they had on this front. So if uh, the next government is also going to take an aggressive stance on this front, then you'll have to have the private sector align at some point. So how do you see these dynamics play out realistically? Well, I, I don't I don't envy the, the leadership of these large multinational companies. It's I'm sure they don't get any sleep at night. <laughs> right. But what they are focused on is the future. And because they're publicly traded, they're focused on profit. They're focused on their shareholders and, and driving those returns. And, you know, I I do think there's a better way to do business that can focus more on the people and local impact. But for now, at least, especially in the current political climate, these these organizations are going to shift as the political wind shift. Right. Made in India, Modi, like they're developing deep manufacturing in India, higher tariffs on China and and you know Vietnam and some other countries, they're shifting iPhone production to to India, right? They've committed to build factories in the United States, um, so they will shift. And in another four years, maybe they'll move manufacturing and continue to build in in Taiwan and in China as well. So they'll continue to shift, right? So, um, uh, Greg, what? Well, um how do, do you see this as a multilateral rupturing or purely a bilateral 2D spectrum, a US versus China and therefore uh, actions and consequences that follow? Or is there a developing mistrust and distrust um, and a lot more inward looking and therefore tech nationalism has caused this multilateral rupturing? It's a very fair question. Um, and I think uh, Scott has underlined that obviously um, the higher the, 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 the geopolitical tension between geopolitical blocks and obviously China and the US, now you might have to a lesser extent the EU and the US. Uh, India is growing as much more than a regional power, you know, in some areas it's definitely a global power. So you might have uh, something along the lines of, 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 of a bilateral sort of, of shift. But uh, there's also a strong multilateral dimension insofar as we are seeing now a kind of balkanization, you know, mosaic of different regimes, of different paces, and that's what Scott um, hinted at uh, in terms of standards, in terms of regulation, in terms of uh, fiscal regimes, and quite frankly, in terms of uh, national uh, political agendas. I mean, it's obviously that in terms of clarity, long time, uh, long, long sightedness, uh, China is leading the way, way more than Europe. Um, but I'd like to go back to the to the the word that you've used, which is an interesting one: tech nationalism. I cannot say, and that's why it matters to uh, to take it and and mirror it with uh, the, your question uh, whether it's about uh, a bilateral or multilateral shift. I'm not so sure it's about nationalism in, in, in every geopolitical bloc. It has a nationalistic dimension in China because it it plays into uh, you know, Xi's. Uh, 100th anniversary agenda. I'm not so sure it's about nationalism in Europe, for instance, or for that matter, honestly, the US. I think there's m more something along the lines, especially as far as the EU is concerned, of a, um, and sorry to play with the with the wording, but I think it does matter uh, for the audience to understand the, the, the nuance of, of the tech patriotism. I don't think Europe is so interested in, um, you know, I want the other's tech to crash, to fail, because I want global dominance. I mean, if I were joking, I would tell you, I wish we were like that, because it would make the EU more, you know, more hungry um, and, and so stronger as, as, as a global competitor. But I think it's mostly making sure that on some key strategic areas that are vital for sovereignty, such as defense, such as um, health data, health systems, um, 
critical infrastructure, generally speaking, energy, obviously, uh, we need a, a, a homegrown solution. Right. Uh, so I would I would mostly talk about uh, uh, tech patriotism, but even then, it's still very difficult because you know there are issues um, to to address and, and and take into account, such as how do you make the 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 distinction or more than the distinction of fair choice between um, the sovereignty imperative and your commitment to open and fair trade. Uh, but I just don't think it's it's only a question for tech. I mean, it's also crucial for, we've seen that with carbon and, and mechanism and, uh, uh, and, and, and climate policy. So um, tech patriotism as it may be, but uh, um, how do you see EU navigate this because clearly there is now distrust or mistrust um, about the transatlantic tech, you know, especially in the Trump era, but also because all of these uh, companies, the tech companies have great level of dominance in the EU markets. Um, so moving away from that is not going to be easy either. So no, there's no, one transatlantic no. tech yeah. diversification and then yeah, there's yeah, a, yeah. A, a critical mineral diversification, within a lot of diversification strategies. But do you think it's an industrial policy approach they'll take or is a regulatory approach or innovation, market levers, letting market play itself out? And if it's one of them, how are they going to reconcile it with their uh, open market values and WTO commitments. How 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 will that interplay work out? Well, one sense is the ORF uh, DNA in the question, and so far as the answer is, is in your question. Look, I, I, it's obvious that Europe is over-reliant on US tech. Uh, I don't need to bring about the facts. Everyone can check them online, but you have roughly three out of four European businesses who are uh, over-dependent on US tech to operate their businesses. Uh, and it can be extremely simple, just your emails. This has massive implications when it comes to security and sovereignty because there are two ways for a European company, just to take that example, to fall under US sanctions. Either you conduct business in uh, the dollar currency and or um, you use uh, e you send emails that, uh, that transit through US-based servers. Anything you do, even if you send your email uh, in, in the Bahamas or here in, in Jakarta, uh, you can just have a U.S. judge knock on your door and say, hey, you, will have, uh, you will have some problems that we need to talk about. So I think this, everyone in Europe is aware. Um, when it comes to the dollar currency, it is slightly more challenging. When it comes to email servers, it's quite frankly easy. What it, it takes for is two things. First is have uh, the cloud and the, and the servers in Europe. I mean, we somehow already have the infrastructure. It's still very small, but it 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 can it can without too many uh, challenges uh, be scaled up. And the second is the regulation. You just cannot leave businesses the 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 freedom to choose whether they right. use US based servers or European. But just doing that in Europe will be seen as an infringement uh, of 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 uh, of civil liberties and, and businesses' freedom. So I think that's one aspect. The second is obviously. Um, in some other areas, um, the infrastructure that we don't have to develop some uh, some products. And if I just take what you mentioned with, uh, can we actually name it? You, did you name Apple? I don't know. Can we do that? Oh, um, you can still did it. Yeah, uh, but but it's we did ju just don't have the supply chain. You know, right. so we used to have it. We had great leaders. We had Alcatel. We had Nokia. And and just because we thought that you know the future was somewhere else, and and nations and geopolitical blocks should focus on what they do best. Well, now we actually. A look back <laughs> on it uh, with a sense of bitterness because it might not have been the smartest um, idea. So, just to conclude, because I don't want to drag on, I think there's a, and, th and that's very problematic. There's a gap between what we need, we can do, and and we know we can do, and you you you've stressed it. And the second aspect is the political leadership, and quite frankly, we don't see it. So just to wrap up, I want to get your thoughts, uh, both of your thoughts on how do you think this AI tech race is going to play out? Do you think it's going to be a binary tech block divide? Do you see, I mean, it's good to be hopeful, but realistically, how do you think it's going to shape up? Uh, as you go ahead, I've, I've spoken so much. Yeah, that I mean, <laughs> I, I imagine 
I mean, right right now the the world is split in two. Uh, I I do imagine in the future that you know this idea of blockification uh, is going to continue at least in the short term, and the world is going to be split in into many. Um, but I don't I don't think blockification is sort of the the end game. I hope anyway. Uh, I mean, in, in the idea of, of AI, like the idea of a single finish line is is a myth. Everything evolved, technology evolves in waves and new leaders emerge quickly. You know, the US and China as massive economies, the EU as massive economies are always gonna be central. But I expect a lot of, I don't even wanna say surprise entrants, but other entrants, right? Brazil or India or Africa, uh, you know, these places who have leapfrogged Western technology in the past and do it by using open models and their sort of unique local strengths. I think dependencies will persist, but so will the resilient strategies that exist. Companies and countries are going to invest in redundancy, multiple supply chains, cloud, regulatory playbooks. So it's not about just about tech it's about national security economic stability and and even culture and then lastly i think the most successful players are going to be the ones that are strong partners and strong connectors not just being builders of of walls or bridges but being builders of new ecosystems mm. uh, interoperability is going to matter data sovereignty is going to matter and you know those are the things that will foster trust, set norms, and really enable collaboration across massive divides. Yeah, I know we're out of time, so I, I just uh, Scott has nailed it. Um, I would just say that the previous industrial revolutions were driven by countries or geopolitical blocks whose uh, control of the key uh, either technology or or uh, raw material oil for that matter uh, made it almost impossible to leapfrog and now Scott underline leapfrogging is just the, the the new black if I may say so so it's not because you're a leader now however advanced that you will remain one in the future and it's not that you look like a, a country that seems to be lagging behind that you won't be leading tomorrow I think what what should make us uh, and I think the ones that will be able to 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 sharpen their competitive edge are those who understand that and prepare for uh, surprises if, if as Scott said but I, I would just say that to conclude that there are countries that we should monitor very closely because they actually uh, those are the pools of talent India is the first one Saudi Arabia the UAE um, I mean, those are countries that have two things, uh, talent and uh, a political uh, vision and will. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was a great discussion. Thank you all for joining us.